Thank you. Um, okay, I guess I will start. Uh, I'm really glad uh, I can have this opportunity today to present our work, uh, the COVID-19 infodemic uh, in online social networks, Twitter versus uh, Facebook. Uh, so my name is uh, Kai Cheng Yang, but you, you can also call me Kevin. Uh, and I, I guess uh, Anatolio already did a really good uh, introduction uh, for me, so I will not do that again. Uh, I just want to quickly mention that uh, I'm part of uh, uh, a center called the Observatory, uh, Observatory on Social Media in Indiana University. Uh, you can check us out. Um, so we have a lot of cool studies and uh, we have a lot of uh, you know, useful tools uh, that you can also play with. Um, so uh, I guess I can get into this talk uh, directly. So why do we uh, study this problem, right? Uh, I mean, in recent days, uh, I, I think the concept of the infodemic is more familiar to uh, most of the people. But in fact, uh, in the early days, in last year, uh, in, in the early days of the pandemic, when the pandemic was still an epidemic, uh, there were people already realizing that we're not just finding, uh, fighting this uh, epidemic, we're fighting a, a whole infodemic. Uh, so not just, we, 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 we need to not just uh, do like medical uh, preventions uh, for this uh, uh, spread of virus, we ha also have to be careful with the misinformation spreading online. So people already, uh, you know, back then, uh, we already realized this is, could be a problem and here, uh, I'm showing you uh, one example that I find on the left, which is a tweet uh, containing uh, some conspiracy theory uh, that was circling around last year. Uh, and you can see there was a lot of retweets, a lot of uh, quotes, a lot of likes. Uh, you know, if you think about how many people may have seen this information, uh, that's actually larger than those numbers. And uh, this, this tweet was just one example. And, uh, you know, a lot of people were talking about that uh, during this uh, uh, epidemic uh, time period, when we're facing a new virus that we don't know how to treat, we don't know how to prevent. I mean, in the early days, right? It's really important for people to receive accurate and cohesive information from their information sources so they can do the right thing to protect themselves. However, if uh, unfortunately people are exposed to a lot of uh, the misinformation, the conspiracy theory, uh, you know, they may do the right, the wrong thing and they may hurt themselves. Uh, this could be uh, damage uh, to the public health. So that's why we believe it's really important to understand uh, the whole online misinformation problem. Uh, you know, for example, we want to uh, learn how, what's the prevalence of the misinformation and how those information was spread, uh, you know, on different platforms. Uh, that's why we sort of started this uh, project last year, uh, hoping, you know, we can uh, have a better understanding uh, of the situation. So uh, the first thing I want to talk about is data collection. Uh, so as our, uh, the title of the paper suggests, uh, we're trying to compare the situation of uh, Twitter and the Facebook, right? Um, so we need to get data from those two platforms. Uh, so what we did was we define a keyword list of all the, you know, possible keywords related to COVID-19. And uh, we also, we only focus on English tweets because, you know, it's not uh, so, uh, easy to analyze uh, different languages and uh, uh, the English uh, discussion is still the minor majority, majority online. Uh, so on Twitter, we use this keyword to search uh, the DECA hole, uh, which is a 10 sample, 10% uh, sample of the Twitter whole volume, right? And we focus on time period from January 1st to the end of October in 2020. And in the end, uh, we got 53 million tweets from 12 million users. And then on Facebook, uh, we tried to do the same thing, but uh, it's a little bit different because Facebook doesn't you know, open the whole, their whole data set to the research community. Uh, but they do have this uh, uh, company called CrowdTango. It's, it's operated by Facebook. Uh, you know, the, so through CrowdTango, you can actually access part of the information from Facebook. 
so you know we don't have information to all the users, but we do have access to uh, public pages and the groups, and that's what we did. We use the same uh, we use the same COVID uh, keyword uh, keywords, and we searched Coral Tango, and we got thirty seven million posts from uh, about one hundred forty k pages and groups. So that's the data that we got. So the next step is to sort of uh, align those two platforms because our goal is to compare them. But if you have reused Twitter and Facebook, uh, you'll know that uh, you know their mechanism were not exactly the same. For example, uh, on Twitter, you know everybody can tweet and you, you can retweet, but uh, technically the retweet is still a tweet, right? Uh, however, on Facebook, uh, especially when we're talking about group and pages, uh, you'll see uh, some posts going on and all other users can go there and reshare, they can comment, re they can react, right? They can do all kinds of things. And, uh, you know, in order for us to make a meaningful comparison between the two platforms, uh, the first thing we tried was to sort of group uh, the different actors into two categories. Uh, the first categories are those, uh, you know, the Twitter users or uh, Facebook group of pages that post original tweets or original posts. And we call them the root users or root group of pages. And then you have the leaf users, uh, which essentially are those users that retweets the original tweets or the users on Facebook that reshare the post or comment or react uh, doing other things. Um, so this way, hopefully, you know, we can compare the root with the root and the leaf with the leaf uh, on two platforms uh, to make this comparison meaningful. So that's what we did. And uh, one thing I want to mention is that on Twitter, we do have the information of, you know, both the root users and the leaf users. But on Facebook, unfortunately, we only have access, you know, to the group and pages. We don't know, uh, you know, who are those leaf users. We just know like how many users reshare or comment or re react to certain posts. So that would be uh, uh, kind of a big, uh, really big difference between the two platforms. Uh, and but uh, uh, but again, you know, later I will show that uh, our comparison were mainly focused on the root users. So that doesn't really. Uh, you know, uh, without access to the leaf users on Facebook, it's not really a big problem in this case. Um, so I mentioned that on Facebook uh, for the post, the users can do all different kinds of things, right? You, they can reshare, they can comment, re they can react. Uh, you know, that's a whole different kind of things. But, uh, you know, we did a sort of a correlation analysis of these uh, actions. And we see that those actions are highly correlated um, so in order to keep things simple, you know, we sort of uh, only focus on the reshare uh, re uh, action of the leaf users and sort of ignore the common reactions. But of course, you know, there could be something more interesting about those. But for this paper, uh, we just focus on the reshare and it sort of corresponds to the retweets on, on Twitter. So that's also a way that we try to, you know, align the two platforms. So now we can talk about uh, how we identify misinformation and also high credibility information. So because our goal is to understand the infodemic problems on the two platforms, so we need a way to identify that misinformation, right? And also in order to provide a meaningful baseline, uh, we also you know, uh, took a look into the uh, what we call high credibility information so that we can compare them. Uh, so you know, uh, uh, to give you uh, to give users uh, to give us a more intuitive sense of um, how severe the misinformation problem is, right? So in order to identify misinformation uh, for such a large scale data set, uh, we adopt a common approach used by many previous studies, uh, which is you know by tracking the URLs or the links. In the Twitter post, Twitter uh, in the Twitter tweets and the Facebook posts that linking to low credibility domains or sources. Um, so this way, you know, you can relatively easily uh, analyze uh, the whole data set in a shorter pe time period. Uh, but how do we know which domain or sources are uh, low credibility or high credibility, right? 
uh, we uh, take advantage uh, of the information provided by a website called Media Bias Fact Check. Um, so this web website is really cool. They have a panel of experts who would manually uh, evaluate a whole bunch of, uh, especially the popular uh, news website and other you know, news sources, and they would uh, assign different labels um, to those uh, website. And uh, uh, for our study, we sort of uh, you know, find the um, website that have a low or very low factual reporting level, uh, according to the media bias fact check website. And also uh, they sort of have a list of uh, what they call uh, questionable sources and uh, conspiracy pseudoscience sources. So all those uh, uh, sources, we call them low quality sources, right? And we compile a list uh, of about uh, 674 sources. And that will be our way to identify the uh, misinformation in our Twitter and uh, Facebook data set. So now uh, about the high quality sources, right? So there are uh, uh, much more, but uh, in order to, you know, again, keep things simple and clean, uh, we manually select uh, some of the most popular, most uh, repu reputable, uh, the mainstream sort of uh, news media sources. And uh, we also sort of uh, want to uh, um, be very biased. So we sort of uh, sample those uh, sources from different uh, beings of the uh, political spectrum in the United States context. And uh, this is a list we have uh, in the end. And in addition, uh, in addition to these news sources, uh, we also add uh, the website for CDC and WHO because uh, although they are not news sources, uh, they do share a lot of uh, information about the COVID-19 uh, uh, virus. So, uh, and also they are reputable, right? So we want to see uh, how they are doing uh, in, in the whole uh, online discussion. Uh, so now that we have a list of all low credibility sources and we have a list of high credibility sources, uh, what we can do is uh, extract the URLs or links uh, in the Twitter post and the Facebook post, uh, and uh, then match uh, you know the whole uh, URLs extracted against those two lists, uh, and that way we can count the number of uh, tweets or Facebook posts containing links to those. Uh, sources, and that way we can do uh, quantitative analysis. So that's kind of the methodology we took. And now that uh, we have everything we need, we can take a look uh, at our uh, results. So the first thing and the, the simplest thing that we look is, uh, you know, what's the prevalence of the low quality information, the misinformation? I want to understand, we have to answer this question. Um, so here, uh, for this analysis, uh, the easiest thing to do is just to count numbers, right? And uh, we did this for each day in the whole time period and on Twitter and on Facebook. Uh, so we showed the daily volume of uh, the post uh, having links to the low quality sources in our data set and uh, show the time series in figure A. And as you can see, uh, there was a peak uh, or a surge uh, in uh, March uh, 2020. It sort of, uh, you know, I still remember what's going on last year. Uh, it sort of uh, correlated with when uh, it really became a, a, a real problem, you know, to most of the American people. Um, that, that's when that happened. And uh, then uh, this peak sort of decreased uh, towards the summer and uh, never really goes up again, right? And we found that uh, on Twitter and Facebook, on the both platform, the, uh, the time series are highly correlated. So that's not super surprised, surprising. So the next thing we did uh, in figure B is to show another two uh, time series. One thing is the total volume of tweets in our data set. So remember, we search uh, the tweet data hole using a keyword list uh, all about COVID-19. So we can roughly use this tweet volume as sort of a, a proxy for public attention, right? How, uh, so to measure uh, how much people were talking about the COVID-19 pandemic on social media. 
And another thing we show in figure B is the uh, seven day average uh, hospitalization rate in the United States. And uh, two interesting patterns uh, emerge uh, in this figure. So the first thing is, you know, if we focus on the Twitter uh, volume time series or the public attention time series, it's sort of uh, 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 cor correlated with the, the low credibility information search in figure A, right? But uh, again, that's not super surprising, but you do see there's a lag between the hospitalization rate between, uh, and the, the public attention uh, line. So it sort of suggests, you know, people first start to realize this is a problem. They start to talk about this. Uh, there are a lot of uh, news coverage going on. And then uh, after some days, uh, you know, people, more and more people start to get sick and they got admitted to the hospital. Uh, so there's a lag between the information and the real world spread of the virus. Um, so that's the first pattern, interesting pattern. Another pattern is that, um, you know, uh, for the hospitalization rate in the, in the early days of the pandemic, you, you, you see a surge, but during the summer, uh, it gets better, right, uh, in last year. But again, in the, uh, uh, in the autumn, sorry, in, in September or something, uh, the situation got worse and the hospitalization rate increased again. However, on the information side, right, you don't see the same uh, peak again, like in March. Uh, it, it feels like, you know, people are not surprised anymore. They just don't stop talking about the COVID-19 pandemic. But uh, the, in real world, the situation got worse. Uh, so that's the second pattern. Um, so the next thing we want to look at is, uh, you know, we see this uh, low credibility information or the infodemic surge in the early days of the pandemic, right? We want to know if this is uh, more of an organic thing or, you know, some uh, uh, what we often call uh, bad actors uh, were trying to push this uh, misinformation, right? Uh, so what we did is uh, that we show in figure C is that we calculate uh, for each day, we calculate the volume of the low credibility, uh, uh, the count of uh, posts linking to low credibility information and the post linking to high quality information and we calculate the ratio. And uh, what you can see is uh, this ratio is relatively stable over the whole time period, uh, except for the early days when you know, we didn't have a lot of uh, data points. So this suggests that um, you know, when the low credibility information came, there were also like uh, coverage from the high credibility information source. So that suggests, you know, we believe uh, this suggests that um, the uh, the whole uh, infodemic uh, surge was more like a, a reflection of the public attention. Uh, so we don't see uh, evidence that you know certain people were uh, intentionally uh, pushing just the, the uh, low credit information. So here we also show on the left side uh, we also show a breakdown of the number of uh, Facebook posts and uh, Twitter tweets uh, containing links to low credit and high credit information. And you can see, uh, you know, you still have more high credit information going on, right? But uh, the low credit information is uh, still, it's, it's not, uh, it, you cannot just ignore them because it's a viable proportion of them. Um, so that's uh, like uh, the overall analysis of the counts, right? The next step we want to do is we want to break things down into the individual uh, sources and we want to see uh, how each sources are, uh, uh, each source behaves on uh, each platform. So here in this figure, we simply um, show the number of, uh, total number of posts or tweets uh, for each uh, domains on Facebook and Twitter. And uh, the color one are the low credit ones and uh, the gray ones are the high credit ones. And as you can see, um, you know, the most popular ones are still the high credit, uh, the mainstream news sources um, followed by, you know, uh, the low credit information uh, sources. Uh, however, if we try to combine all the low credit information altogether and then the volume 
uh, is bigger than any other uh, uh, information sources. Um, so that's one finding of this analysis. Uh, another thing we realized by looking at this figure you know, on Facebook and Twitter, uh, we re realized that although there seems to be a correlation between the two platforms in terms of uh, sources popularity, it's not really the same, right? It seems some pop, uh, some um, domains were more popular uh, than uh, on one platform than uh, the others. So what we did is we did a rank comparison of the low credibility sources. Um, so this figure might be a little bit uh, uh, crowded, but let me uh, break things down. So. Uh, According to our analysis, uh, we have five, uh, 500 or something uh, low quality sources that appear uh, in both uh, our Facebook uh, data collection and uh, Twitter data collection, right? And for each source, we can uh, calculate the prevalence and we can uh, generate a rank uh, of them on each platform. Uh, so this way, each domain or each uh, low quality information source has uh, to rank or a coordinate, and we can use this coordinate to put them on this uh, on this figure. Uh, and uh, eventually, you know, uh, on this figure, if uh, a, a, a information source is on the left side of the figure, it means it's more popular on Facebook than you know its popularity on on Twitter. So if it's on the right right side of the figure, it means it's more popular on Twitter than Facebook. Um, so before we did this analysis, we were ex expecting to see that, you know, kind of a high correlation between the two platforms, right? If one source is popular on one platform, it should also be popular on the other one, right? But the result is uh, kind of not that, right? We see uh, the, the dots, uh, each dot is a source, right? It's all over the places. It suggests uh, their uh, popularity uh, uh, are really different on the two platforms. And uh, we manually label some of the sources uh, close to the boundary of the figure, which means, uh, you know, the popular difference on two platforms are uh, really large. And uh, you, you can see some of them here uh, on the left. And uh, next on the right, it's basically uh, a closer look of the most popular ones, right? Uh, for, uh, of the domains that were on the top 50 on both platforms. Uh, so it's part of the left figure, it's just uh, a, a part of it. And uh, we sort of uh, um, annotated all of them. And again, you can see, you know, for example, for Brad Park on the, on the top, it's really like popular on both platforms. But for some other domains, uh, for example, the Gateway Pundit, uh, it's not so, it's more popular on Twitter than on Facebook. Um, so this is one of our analysis showing that uh, it seems that uh, two platforms, um, the users on two platforms seems to be, um, seems to prefer different content, right? Uh, so that's, uh, that's the comparison analysis. So here is another analysis that uh, we really tried to do, but kind of hard, but also we, we think there was, there was something interesting going on, which is uh, the analysis on the suspicious YouTube videos. So uh, earlier we we're tracking the URLs, right? But uh, that's that was not the only way uh, misinformation spread because uh, you know people can just create a bunch of YouTube videos and talk about different things and uh, share this on uh, social media. And uh, what we did is we first, uh, you know, like what we did to the uh, news sources, we extract uh, the YouTube video links from the, from the Facebook and Twitter uh, data collection. And uh, uh, in order to find the suspicious ones, you know, we use the YouTube API to find the video that, were, that had been removed because uh, we know that YouTube has taken a lot of uh, actions against uh, the spread of uh, the COVID-19 misinformation. So they remove a lot of uh, videos. So we sort of have to assume that if a video was removed by, by YouTube already, uh, it's kind of a susp suspicious. And uh, this way we can find a group of uh, uh, suspicious YouTube videos uh, in our data set. And we did the same analysis like before, you know, we calculate the rank, popularity rank 
and put them uh, in this figure. And then what we did is we did a sort of a manual um, uh, annotation or you know manual analysis of the YouTube uh, video because even though they are removed, uh, the nice thing about the Facebook data is that it, it actually contains uh, the title of the YouTube video. So we can actually try to find if there are other information about the video still available on the internet. Uh, for example, uh, there was something called a Wayback Machine. Uh, it's a website uh, sort of archiving all kinds of different websites and you can find some, some information about the deleted video there. And another source that we use is uh, another, uh, another video website called uh, BitChoot. Um, so a lot of people, you know, when their video got uh, removed by YouTube, they will try to re-upload the video to BitChute uh, so that, you know, the video is still available. Uh, but that also gave us a way to sort of, uh, uh, you know, actually watch the video being removed by YouTube. And uh, uh, we actually uh, watch, uh, watched a lot of the videos and we, uh, like before, we annotated some of the uh, video that has a really different popularity level on both platform and uh, sort of write down their topic uh, here in this figure. So for example, uh, we see a lot of uh, like uh, different doctors uh, talking about like different uh, conspiracy theories, uh, that, that kind of thing. So um, yeah, but basically we're seeing the same pattern that, you know, some videos are more popular on one platform. Uh, some are more popular on the other one. So there doesn't there doesn't seem to be a, like a universal or a highly correlated uh, pattern going on here. Um, so another thing we did with the YouTube video is we want to see their the relationship between their popularity on Twitter and Facebook, and whether they are likely to be removed by YouTube, right? Um, so what we did is we rank their popularity on Facebook and Twitter, and we break uh, them into different bins in terms of the popularity and then we check the percentage of video in each bin being already being removed by youtube and uh, we see this pattern where you know it seems if a youtube video is more popular on twitter and on facebook uh, it's more likely to be removed um, we, we guess it's because you know uh, when they got popular on social media on a, other social media platforms uh, more people will try to report them to facebook uh, sorry, uh, report them to YouTube, and and then they got uh, if they are really uh, trying to spread the misinformation, they got removed. Um, so that's kind of our analysis. Uh, unfortunately, you know, because of the video were removed, we couldn't get um, too much information about them. So the analysis here about the YouTube videos are kind of uh, preliminary, but we still think it's really interesting, and we do hope that you know in the future we can figure out other ways to look more into this. So that's more about the prevalence or the you know the popular comparison of the local uh, information on two platforms. The next thing we want to do is to characterize the information uh, inform infodemic spreaders. So we want to know who are the actors uh, playing a bigger roles in the whole uh, spreading of the misinformation, right? So uh, we have to go back to the. Uh, diagram that I shared earlier where we sort of uh, divided the users into root or leaves. And uh, in this case, we are more interested in the root users because uh, they are the one posting original tweets containing you know, the links or YouTube videos uh, to those uh, uh, local information sources. So they are the one introducing the information into these social media platforms. And also because you know we don't really have information about the leaf users on Facebook, so we kind of have to focus on the root user. Um, so in order to quantify uh, the rules, uh, the first thing we do is we introduce a measurement uh, to try to measure the concentration of influence on the root users. And it's defined by this uh, formula here on the screen, but uh, don't be overwhelmed by it because I will give you a um, intuitive uh, explanation. Um, so uh, by definition, this uh, concentration measure is just the reverse of the entropy. Uh, but to explain it uh, here in this uh, slide on the left-hand side, 
for example, we have three different root users, and uh, each one of them have three uh, have two tweets, right? And we if we can uh, calculate the concentration of the tweet distribution across the three users, you will have a relatively low concentration level, because uh, you know the tweets are evenly constant, uh, evenly distributed across the the different uh, uh, users. Uh, but on the right hand side, you still have the same uh, three users, but uh, one user has uh, much more tweets than the other two, right? And this time, if you calculate the concentration measure, it will be close to one, because uh, this time the distribution is highly skewed and uh, the distribution is really concentrated on one of the users. And so using this measure, we can sort of measure uh, uh, how you know, the tweets or the retweets are concentrated uh, around, uh, around the root users. And uh, this is the result. So what we did is, you know, we applied the measure mentioned uh, just now to different uh, local media domains, and uh, we uh, separate the original tweets and the retweets. And for each domain, we can get a concentration measurement uh, of, of those tweets or retweets around the root users. And then we can plot all the result into this um, uh, box plot. And uh, we did this for both Twitter and Facebook. So what we see here is the concentration level of the original tweets are kind of low on both Twitter and Facebook, right? And on the other hand, if we focus on retweets or reshares, um, the concentration level is really high. And uh, we actually did some statistical uh, tests to show that this difference is uh, significant. So what does this mean, right? Uh, we, we think this means there are many different accounts post uh, that, that post locality URLs on both platforms, right? Uh, as the roots. Uh, however, only some of them, uh, a small group of them, of them get retweeted or reshared uh, extensively. So that's what the figure is telling us. And uh, that means that we believe is that um, there are the so-called super spreaders. Uh, it's kind of similar to the uh, virus spread, you know, uh, a small group of uh, people are responsible for spreading, spreading the virus to a really large group of other people. So we see a kind of a similar pattern in the online information spreading process of the low carb low information. But then the question is, who are those super spreaders, right? Uh, what, what, what are those accounts? So here is an example. So um, we find a lot of those super spreaders, the key spreaders are actually the official account of the information source, right? In this case, uh, I'm showing you the, the gateway uh, pundit and you can actually find their official Twitter account and Twitter uh, Facebook page uh, through the website. And uh, you can see those two uh, accounts were actually verified by Twitter and Facebook. And uh, if, you know, according to our analysis on Twitter, you know, for the uh, retweets containing links to the Gateway Pundit, right? 20% of the retweets were from uh, the root user of the 20% of the retweets are actually uh, this one account. And for Facebook, that number is even higher. It's six. 68%. So it's highly skewed, right? This single account was posting uh, links to the website and uh, causing a lot of retweets or reshares on Twitter and Facebook. So that's what we saw. And, uh, you know, uh, we include more uh, popular domains uh, and do the same analysis. So basically we focus on the local domains that was on the top 50 on both platform, right? Uh, and uh, we try to find their uh, official uh, Twitter handle and official Facebook page and groups. And it turns out most of them do have those uh, official accounts, right? And uh, we further see you know, whether those accounts are verified and they are, most of them are verified. And also most of the, those official accounts are the top spreader, the number one spreader 
all of the you know the information linking to this source. Uh, and sometimes if they are not the top one, they are the second one. Um, so that's pretty much uh, true for all of all of them. So that's where we find you know those infodemic super spreader tend to be the official accounts and tend to be verified. So that's kind of uh, uh, interesting. And and uh, uh, when we analyze uh, the data in last year, uh, all those official accounts were still like uh, you know. Um, uh, alive, but uh, later, you know, uh, when we're uh, editing the manuscript uh, this year, uh, uh, later, right, uh, some of the accounts, for example, the, the Gateway Pundit account, uh, official Twitter account and Facebook page was uh, uh, blocked. Uh, I, I think the Twitter one was blocked. Facebook page was maybe maybe still there. So uh, apparently the platform were trying to do something, but, uh, you know, for the other uh, information sources, those accounts were still there. Um, so that's about the information spreaders. Uh, the last thing that we see was uh, what we called infodemic manipulation. Like earlier, we want to say whether people are trying to push this information, right? We didn't see a uh, signal in terms of the volume, but we did some other, other analysis. So one thing we look into uh, was uh, what we call coordinated sharing of links on Facebook. Um, so here I'm showing you a network uh, realization, right? Uh, right? Uh, each node is a Facebook uh, pages or uh, groups, and they are clustered into smaller groups uh, because those group of accounts within you know, this cluster they tend to share the same set of uh, locally information sources repeatedly. So as an example, if we uh, look at uh, the blue uh, group, a group blue cluster uh, in this figure, they really like to share uh, information from Breitbart and Washington Times uh, together uh, uh, at the same time, you know, uh, in, in their post. And uh, those group of users do the same thing. So we, we sort of group them together. And for the pink one, you know, uh, highlighted here, uh, they also like to share uh, like uh, pgmedia.com and also, also Washington, Paul, uh, Washington Times and the Uh You know, there's a pattern there. They, 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 they do the same thing. Uh, so we do believe that they do this not just by coincidence, uh, but, but because uh, they were sort of uh, coordinated. And we actually checked some of the groups and we saw that, for example, the pink, uh, the highlighted pink cluster here, uh, the, all, the, all those pages and groups were associated with, uh, there was a radio station called The Answer. So uh, apparently, you know, they're not just individual uh, pages and the groups. Uh, they are uh, part of a bigger, um, uh, I would say, organization that's trying to you know, push some information, some narratives. Uh, so that's what we find on Facebook. And uh, we actually did the same analysis on Twitter and we saw the same thing, right? You see uh, different Twitter users, uh, although they don't seem to be correlated with each other. If you check the local information they, they share, uh, you see some common patterns. So we believe you know, there are coordinated uh, efforts on both platforms. Um, so that's pretty much everything, all the results that I want to share today. So here are some uh, take home messages. Um, so I, I guess the most important lesson we learned here is that uh, the infodemic spreads on multiple social platforms. I mean, it, it's kind of obvious, but uh, for previous um, studies, people usually focus just on one platform. So. Uh, it's not typical, like, you know, the researchers to look at this question, this problem uh, for different platforms at the same time. And according to our analysis, um, it seems different platforms are uh, having different appetite, you know, for different content. However, if you perform quantitative uh, analysis, you will see similar patterns uh, across different platforms. Um, so it suggests, I think, for future study, um, uh, researchers should consider more about doing a cross-platform analysis uh, to review, you know, the bigger picture, you know, not just for one platform, but 
for the whole information ecosystem, hopefully. Uh, another thing, uh, really important lesson we learned is that uh, the infodemic content was spreading overly, right? There was a small group of high profile user super spreaders that were responsible for a large amount of uh, misinformation online. And uh, this actually posed um, some really serious challenges to moderate because, uh, you know, you, you can't just uh, ban all those uh, accounts, right? Uh, because uh, like, like Twitter and Facebook has already uh, been trying to uh, allegedly uh, taking more actions against uh, the spread of misinformation, but also there were a lot of uh, criticism against them, seeing them, they are sort of biased and also what they did, you know, blocking the accounts were a violation uh, of the, you know, were, were hurting the uh, free speech. So there was a lot of uh, um, discussion going on about this and uh, we need to find a more systematic and a smarter way uh, to deal with this uh, situation. Um, so that's the take home message and uh, um, at the last, I want to thank my team. Uh, this work wouldn't be possible with, uh, you know, all their efforts. Uh, and uh, uh, also, you know, if you want to uh, read our paper for more details, you can find the link here. You can scan the QR code. And I, I believe uh, you, you can also find a link in the chat shared uh, earlier. And also, if you have more questions, uh, you want to talk to me, you can find me through email and or uh, you know, find me on Twitter. So I'm really happy to talk more. And uh, also, uh, I believe we still have some time left so we can have some Q&A session, I guess. So yeah, that's my uh, presentation. Uh, I hope uh, it's uh, helpful for you. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Thank you, Kevin. Very informative. Great uh, walk through your methods and results. Um, I was just checking the Gateway Pundit information about the account being banned. And what's interesting, the Twitter account was banned yeah. earlier this year, not yeah. because of the COVID-related misinformation they might be spreading, but because of the um, misinformation about 2020 U.S. presidential election. Uh, yeah, but <laughs> it was, I mean, it's kind of hard to, so, so the, the discussion about the pandemic was uh, largely politicized in America. So sometimes it's really hard to dis disentangle those two things. Uh, it's just uh, for, at least for this study, we sort of uh, focus on the information side. We didn't really touch the political side, but you know, there are a lot of uh, interesting research questions that you know, people can try to answer um, about the same uh, Phenomenal, I would say, yeah. So I see a question from Melody Norison about how you so, identify misinformation. And I think it goes back to your media bias database. Yeah, loan. we are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe I can read the question a little bit. I didn't see this during my presentation. So uh, yes, um, Brad Hard was like a really a uh, big, uh, really popular uh, source of uh, misinformation here. Um, so yeah, about how we identified the misinformation. Yes, we are looking at, uh, no, we didn't look at the title uh, because um, you know it's really hard to um, identify misinformation by their content. Uh, that's actually a really good uh, research question that a lot of people are working on, but uh, uh, you know, I, I don't think there is currently a uh, really good solution that you can just, you know, for them build a machine learning model and you feed the title or the content of the article to the model and it will tell whether it's a uh, misinformation or not. I, I, I don't think so. Uh, so what we did is, you know, we, if we believe uh, information source is sort of a low credibility, we sort of consider all the information from this source is low credibility. Uh, we understand that this is actually maybe not true, right? Uh, and there's room for improvement, but uh, that's the best uh, we can do uh, now, uh, you know, to solve this uh, problem. 
uh, I hope that answer your um, sort of question. Uh, yeah. So any, any other questions? We have about uh, 12 minutes. Yeah. And as some of you type, feel free to use microphone as well if it's easier to ask the question. Yeah. I was uh, curious. Uh, can, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I, I, I want to add a little bit more to the question just before, because uh, for the uh, YouTube video analysis, we actually try to look into the content because for YouTube, you cannot say, oh, it's from YouTube, it's, it's bad, right? You have to do a more granular kind of analysis. But um, we also sort of realize that it's hard because uh, we have to watch the video one by one, you know, to sort of make sure. So it, it's really uh, not really efficient. So we couldn't scale the analysis up. Uh, but I think that will be the direction that you know, we're trying to find a way that using computational method to help us uh, sort of uh, check the content, not just the URL domain, uh, and to help us uh, find a missing region. But again, you know, that's uh, really a, a big challenge, I would say, a big question. Um, yeah. Sorry about uh, interrupting you. Oh, no, no problem. I was just curious, many of us who are studying all kinds of misinformation uh, encountered the problem that you also mentioned where content would disappear, uh, you know, randomly when the platform pushed uh, and they trying to clean up some of the websites. And, and what we ended up having is the, as uh, my colleague in the lab, Philip Bayer likes to say, is a Swiss cheese problem where you have cheese, but with holes without any data about some of those suspicious accounts that were banned. Uh, any useful strategies you might want to share with us how you approach this, this issue? Uh, actually, um, some of the member of our group um, were trying to uh, study this, uh, you know, uh, removed accounts problem, uh, especially on Twitter, because we do have data on that. Um, so I'm uh, not involved in that project, uh, unfortunately, because I, you know, it, it's sort of my last year, so I need to uh, do my dissertation and do other things. So I couldn't really like, I, I was interested, but I couldn't join, but I, I sort of know what they are trying to do was that, um, you know, we, uh, uh, at IU, we have access to the data whole data set, right? So Twitter would send their 10% uh, data every day to us. And then later, if well, some accounts are removed, um, they will ask us to also remove the data from this user uh, backwards from our data. And it, it's really hard, we, we're doing that, right? But, uh, but again, that actually gave us a way to sort of study this um, problem, right? Uh, so in order to do this, you, you have to collect data first and then wait for the account to be removed. And then you can come back and see uh, what's going on. However, there's a uh, challenge because they are removed, right? And also, Twitter actually forbid us to do this. So, oh, I, I forgot you are recording this. So uh, we, we, I should probably not see this, but uh, um, but we, we, we still believe, I, I mean, uh, we understand that, um, you know, there's concern about uh, user privacy because some user might want to remove them, uh, their own account, and they don't want other people to see it anymore. And we uh, respect that, right? But we also believe, um, like it's important to understand the deleted Twitter, uh, tweet, tweet accounts and the content. And also we, we actually believe this is uh, one strategy to evade detection because you can actually post a lot of uh, misinformation and then you delete them and leave no trace at all. And nobody will know that happened, but people already saw it, right? So uh, we believe that all, uh, that's more important than, you know, uh, let's see, uh, following Twitter's policy. So we, we are trying to do something, uh, working on it. And uh, so we will see what we will what we'll find. And we will definitely, you know, make that trade-off between whether, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, uh, of course we will re respect the privacy of the users, right? But also we want to enter that framework. We want to see what we can, we can find. Um, so that's about Twitter, right? And also about YouTube video. So we sort of find a way because uh, like I said, uh, even though it, they were the content were removed on YouTube, uh, you cannot see it on YouTube anymore. People uh, re-upload them to other platforms, and that gave us a way to sort of uh, go back and see what's going on, right? So mm -hmm. that's another um, strategy that we took. Um, so yeah, 
adopting uh, cross-platform research approach. Yes, yes. We have uh, time for one more question, and the question posted to the chat room from Milad. Yeah, um, maybe I can read the question. It says, yes. would you see your research can be applied to other topics in other language or we've seen that are not yet uh, become viral? Yes, I believe so. It's just we focus on English, we focus on COVID, but you can definitely um, do the same thing for you know pretty much anything uh, that you're interested in. And, uh, yeah, we actually hope to see more this kind of research because the pattern we find, is we don't know how generalizable it is, right? We know it, it's for COVID, it's like this, but for other topics, we don't know. Maybe maybe it's totally different or maybe it's similar, right? So it'd be interesting to actually see this. So we have um, one more question from Amir. If you wanna take a quick yeah. look. Uh, okay, I can also, I guess I can read the question. So thank you for the great work and presentation. Thank you uh, for the kind of work. And I see you did an extensive content analysis of misinformation spreader in Twitter and Facebook. And I'm curious to know whether uh, you got a sense of which of these two platforms did better in terms of uh, mitigating the spread of the misinformation. I know you noticed some accounts being suspended suspected faster in Twitter and Facebook, were though these are kind of random observation or is this a conclusion of some content analysis uh, I, I I think that's a good question. Unfortunately, I really couldn't tell because, um, you know, we don't, we don't know what Twitter and Facebook did, uh, you know, behind the curtain, right? Um, we, we, we do see some moderation efforts, but given the recent, uh, you know, uh, leaks about Facebook uh, internal, you know, the, the whole uh, whole thing going on recently, you know, you, you really, you, I, I couldn't really tell, you know, whether whether uh, they are doing something good or whether they're try, just trying to make them look like they're doing something good, right? So I, I, I don't know. Um, yeah. Which, which also makes it difficult. Um, and I like Amira, your question about, well, which platform is actually doing a better job at blocking things? Um, but because we don't really know what's happening on the back end of those platforms and when, it's really hard. It's like comparing, comparing apples and oranges. But it's a good research yeah. question. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. But um, you know, I'm afraid it will be hard to answer with the data that we can have access to. Because <laughs> that's, yeah, you, you, you know, that's what they want us to have, I guess, so. Well, uh, Kevin, thank you so much again for your time. Excellent work and sharing your links and resources. Uh, I think many people attended here will check them out. I just want to flag um, those of you who are here, uh, please join us in two weeks. We're going to have the second guest talk by Mark Green. He and his colleagues at the University of Liverpool did an, another excellent paper where they look at Twitter specifically. COVID-related um, misinformation that was spread before their official announcement of the national lockdown back in March of 2020 and then after. So they did this time series analysis to see whether misinformation trends are different before and after that, that government policy that uh, were put in place. So come back here in two weeks. The talk is at noon Eastern time. So otherwise I will uh, wish everyone a great great week. Uh, here in Canada, we're going to have a long Thanksgiving weekend. So happy, happy holiday and stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Thank you again for the great opportunity and really uh, excited to talk with all of you. <laughs>